So Merry Christmas. Today, if you didn't know, is the seventh day of Christmas. And so for our sermon today, I thought we would reflect on seven swans of swimming. What do you think? Not going to do that. But it's easy for us to have already moved on from Christmas. I mean, there's so much buildup and anticipation leading up to December 25th that typically by the time it comes, we're ready to move on to the next thing. But in reality, Christmas is not a day, it's a season. For thousands of years, Christmas has been celebrated as a 12-day season in which we feast and remember the birth of Christ. And it culminates on January 6th in what's called the Epiphany, when we remember that the Magi came to worship Jesus about two years after he was born. So all that to say, it's still Christmas for a little bit. And so for that reason, today we're going to bring to a close our quest to recapture the real story of Christmas. Now typically, when we think of the story of Christmas in Luke's Gospel, we assume that by the end of that first Christmas night, when the shepherds and the angels have gone and Mary and Joseph have their baby swaddled in the manger, we think that's kind of end of the story, end of scene. But Luke chapter 2 doesn't end there. As a matter of fact, Luke continues to tell us some important things about what happened in the first days and weeks of the life of Jesus. And so we want to take a look at that today and particularly at a a bit of an unknown Christmas uh, story character, a guy named Simeon. Now, remember, we've been walking through this story of Christmas, and and we've seen that there's these high drama, miraculous moments in the story, from angelic visitations to virgin conceptions to the long, arduous journey from, from Nazareth to Bethlehem to making room for the baby to be born and laid in a manger to angels appearing to shepherds and shepherds praising God. And by the end of all of that, Mary and Joseph are praising God that their child is safely in the world. But I also imagine they're exhausted. I mean, that's a lot to go through for anybody. And I also imagine that they're ready for their lives to return to some kind of normalcy. It's true that their child is the son of God, but he's also their son. And so I imagine Mary and Joseph were ready to get into some kind of normal rhythm. And I'm looking at babies out here, right? You need a little rhythm if you're going to raise a kid. And so Luke tells us, beginning in Luke 2, verse 21, that Mary and Joseph spent the first few weeks of Jesus' life doing what any normal, faithful Jewish mother and father would do. They started to raise their son. And in particular, in those days, faithful Jewish parents did three things in the first six weeks of their child's life. If their child was a son, the first thing they did was they had the child circumcised. And Luke tells us in Luke 2, 21, that on the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised. Now, why circumcision? Well, from the days of Abraham in Genesis 17... Circumcision was the physical sign of belonging to the spiritual people of God. And so every man in uh, Israel history was circumcised on the eighth day. Now in our time, we don't use circumcision as the sign of belonging to the people of God. We use something else. It's called baptism. When you're baptized, it becomes a sign of belonging to the people of God. But in Jesus' day, this was the faithful way to do it. In obedience to Genesis 17, Jesus was circumcised. Now, it was also the case in ancient Israel that when a mother gave birth, she was considered to be ritually impure for seven days after childbirth. And so Mary, in obedience to Old Testament law, underwent purification rites. You can read about this in Leviticus 12. But instead of turning there, just trust me, it's there, okay? Leviticus 12 outlines a process where a woman who's given birth, seven days later, she appears before the priest and she brings an offering with her. And that offering is a lamb and a small pigeon or a turtle dove. Right? And they make a sacrifice and then there's a process by which mom becomes ritually pure again. Well, we're told in Luke 2.24 that when Joseph and Mary begin these purification rites and they come to the priest, they bring with them not a lamb and a pigeon, but they bring two pigeons. And that's interesting because in Leviticus 12, we are told that if you don't have enough money to afford a lamb, you can bring two pigeons. And so what it tells us 
is that Joseph and Mary didn't have much for financial resources. They couldn't afford a lamb, so they did what the Bible gave provision for. They brought two pigeons with them, and Mary began her purification rites. The third thing that Mary and Joseph do in the first weeks of Jesus' life is when Jesus is six weeks old, they take their infant to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be consecrated. Now this harkens back to Exodus 13 when the Israelites were getting ready to come out of Egypt and God commanded them that the firstborn son was to be consecrated or dedicated to the Lord. And so in obedience to that expectation of the law, Jesus comes to the temple to be consecrated or dedicated. And so Luke just walks through these three very normal practices that Joseph and Mary go through. And why is he telling us this? But because Luke wants us to know that from the very beginning, Jesus is a kosher Messiah. He's Jewish from birth. He'll be Jewish until the day that he dies. And he is faithful to the law. He has parents who are faithful to the law. And later in his life, Jesus will be accused by some religious leaders of skirting the law. And Jesus will say, no, 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 I did not come to abolish the law of God. I came to fulfill it. From the very beginning, Jesus and his family, they are faithful. And it's about six weeks after Jesus is born, they're coming to the Jerusalem temple to have Jesus dedicated. And it's at that moment that Luke introduces us to a character named Simeon. Now, Simeon is an old man. He's an old Jewish man living in Jerusalem. And Luke wants us to know just a few things about him. He tells us that Simeon is devout, righteous, and that the Holy Spirit is upon him. Anytime the Bible tells you that somebody is righteous, devout, and full of the Holy Spirit, that is a clue to you that this is a trustworthy person. We're told that Simeon was one who'd been looking for and waiting for the day when God's Messiah would come. He'd been reading his Bible, praying for salvation to come, praying for the Messiah talked about in the prophets to come. And then Luke tells us one day Simeon had a vision from God, a fantastic vision. Listen to this, Luke 2, 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So get this, Simeon, a man who's been praying his whole life, been reading his Bible his whole life, has been devout his whole life, he suddenly gets this revelation from God, before you die, you're going to see the Messiah. The Messiah you've been reading about, the Messiah you've been praying for, you're going to see him with your own eyes before you die. Now, Simeon's an old man. He knows he doesn't have many days left on earth. So this has to be exciting for him because it means the Messiah's coming soon. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't had many moments in my life where I've had these kinds of revelations from God. And I sometimes think, what was so special about Simeon that he got this revelation from God? And then I realized Simeon was devout. He prayed every day. He read his Bible all the time. Do you know how many revelations he had in life? One. (laughs) This one. And it's a reminder to us that sometimes you just have to devote yourself to prayer and Bible study. And some days it feels like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Or some days it feels like, I'm not sure I'm hearing anything from the Lord. But if you don't make yourself available, God can't speak. Simeon made himself available all of his life. And in his old age, he heard from the Lord, you're going to see the Messiah. And he sensed the Lord nudging him to go to the temple. And wouldn't you know that when Simeon arrives at the temple, Mary and Joseph are arriving at the same time, bringing Jesus to be dedicated. And as soon as Simeon lays eyes on the baby Jesus, he feels compelled to pick him up and cradle him in his arms. Now I want you to get this scene in your mind. We're blessed to have some babies in this church. So parents of babies, I want you to imagine you're bringing your newborn to church for the very first time. And some strange old guy you never met comes up to you and says, I'd like to hold your baby. Right? That's what's happening. And Mary and Joseph are maybe creeped out at first, but this guy insists. And so we've got Simeon 
cradling this six-week-old baby Jesus. And when he looks into the eyes of Jesus, he is led to sing a song. Simeon is singing. Remember, we saw on Christmas Eve, the angels were singing. Remember, when Mary was told by the angels she was pregnant, Mary started singing. Something about this Jesus makes people want to sing. And so Simeon, he starts praising God and singing right in the middle of the temple courts. Imagine the scene as people are listening to him as he's holding this baby. And listen to what he sings in Luke 2.29. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon sees in the baby Jesus the fulfillment of the promise God made him that he would see the Messiah before he dies. And he says, you know what? I can die now. You can dismiss me in peace. Simeon holds on to the baby Jesus and says, I am ready to die. I want you to think about the significance of this moment. You know, for all of human history, the death rate has been 100%. But, that, but 100% of the people would prefer not to die. And for most of human history and for most of us, death comes as a fearful thing because death means the end. It means separation from family and loved ones and from life. Simeon is at peace and he's ready to die. And he's ready to die because he has done what? He has received Jesus. And in so doing, he's found peace salvation through this baby. I think we have here in Simeon just a sneak peek into what the gospel really is. For just as Simeon received Jesus into his arms, the the, the scriptures offer that you and I can receive Jesus into our hearts and that in that moment of receiving him, we're ready to die. Now, it's not that we die right away. It's not that we're looking for an early death. But when you receive Jesus, you live as those who are unafraid to die. Why? Because salvation is found in this child. As soon as Simeon picks him up in his arms, he says, I can go in peace now. But Simeon's song doesn't stop there. Listen to what he says, verses 30 to 32. My eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. What is Simeon seeing in this moment? But he's seeing not only is this Jesus my Savior, not only is this Jesus the Jewish Messiah, but this Jesus is the light for all nations. Already from the beginning, Simeon is able to see that Jesus has come, not just to be Israel's Messiah, but to be the Savior of the whole world. Well, imagine what it is to be Mary and Joseph in this moment. This old man is holding your baby, singing this song, and what's he saying? This is my Savior. And you're thinking to yourself, well, the angel told us he was a Savior, and now Simeon is confirming to us what the angel had already said to us. Imagine how marvelous it was for them to witness this act of praise from Simeon. And then Simeon turns to Mary and Joseph, and he speaks a word of prophecy to them. Now, mind you, The prophet Malachi is the final prophet of the Old Testament. When the Old Testament closes, there weren't any prophets speaking the word of the Lord in Israel. Not for 400 years. Until Jesus shows up and now Simeon becomes a prophet. And he's going to speak a word of prophecy. Listen to what he says to Mary and Joseph. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What's he saying? 
He's saying this Jesus, this child, he's going to be the, the cause of the rising of many. And, and, and he's looking ahead to the future when what will Jesus do? He will lift up the lowly. He will heal the sick. He will raise the dead. He, he will be on the side of the poor. He'll proclaim good news to the captives. This Jesus will cause the rising of many. But it will also cause many to fall. Because this Jesus will be rejected and, and the true hearts of people will be revealed. And, and the religious leadership in Israel who, who were supposedly the ones that were supposed to recognize the Messiah, their true hearts will be revealed in the process of what's happening. And then Mary and Joseph will have their own soul pierced. Why? Well, what's going to happen for Mary in 33 years? But she's going to sit at the foot of the cross and see her son crucified. So Simeon speaks this word of prophecy and he says, this baby is going to be the cause of the rise and fall of many people. And when I hear that, it makes me shudder because it makes me realize something. Do you realize that the gift of Jesus, the Savior of the world come at Christmas, is either going to cause you to rise up or it's going to cause you to fall down. The gospel of Jesus will either lead you on the way that leads to eternal life or you will stumble over Jesus. And in stumbling over Jesus, you will find that your true heart is revealed. And it occurs to me that the best way to be raised up by Jesus is to fall down before him. And so as we begin a new year, I was wondering what it would look like for us to start the year by falling down before him so that he might lift us up. John Wesley, who is the founder of our Methodist tradition, wrote a beautiful prayer. It's called the Covenant Prayer. And he would encourage people to say this prayer on New Year's Eve every year. And we're going to say that prayer together in just a moment. And it's a prayer that invites us to surrender our lives to God all over again and to recognize that our lives are in God's hands and, and that we should be indifferent to anything else other than God getting what God wants in our lives. And as we begin a new year, I thought we ought to begin the new year by praying this prayer. And we don't do this very often in our church. If you grew up Catholic, you did this all the time. But if you're able, I'm going to invite you right in your pew. If you're able, not everybody's able, but if you're able, I'm going to invite you right in your pew to kneel. And we're going to say this prayer, and I'm going to, I'm going to say it out loud, and you're going to repeat after me because you're not going to be able to see the screen when you're kneeling. And as we say this prayer, I want you to just capture these words, and then we're going to sing these words because this prayer is our desire to fall before Jesus so that he might raise us up in the new year. Let's pray together. Pray these words after me. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things. to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Let us have a moment of silent prayer.
able, I invite you to stand and let's sing this prayer.